We had a pretty big week in X Men. We had Immortal X Men. We had X Men the regular series. We had New Mutants. I think we even had uh, Knights of X or whatever. Obviously, we're going to skip the crap and get right to the good comic books. We're going to talk about Immortal X Men and X Men. And here with me to do that is my good friend Doc. How you doing, Doc? I am well, sir. Thank you very much. By X Men standards, we had a pretty damn good week here. We're going to cover Immortal X Men. This is issue number three from Kieran Gillen and Lucas Werdick. This isn't exactly my cup of tea when it comes to comic books. It's too wordy. It reads too much like a sonnet, in my opinion. But there's some really interesting stuff here, Doc, because we have Destiny. She's in some type of coma or something as she's seeing the future. And Mystique and her are kind of intertwined. And we're seeing like a lot of information being poured out. And finally, the council, the Quiet Council, are learning just how deceptive Mystique was in bringing Destiny back and all the people that she played. I'm amused at the fact that they're all figuring this out now. Xavier never bothered to ask Hope, hey, by the way, where'd you get the Cerebro helmet? And why are you wearing it all the time? So it, it took them fucking long enough. They're all realizing, oh my God, Mystique tricked us. The shape-shifting assassin spy lady tricked us. Holy shit, who'd have thunk that? And we're seeing kind of all these visions that Destiny is having. She's seeing multiple futures, and she's seeing a future where everyone has like a red diamond on their head. Obviously, it has to do with Mr. Sinister. And it comes down to Destiny needs things to play out in her favor in the future to get the future that she wants. And she can see that her biggest obstacle is, in fact, Mr. Sinister, because he's altering things here and there. She talks a lot about Nexus's points in time where events happen. And obviously, one of them is Mr. Sinister developing these chimera mutants and things like that are going to change the foundation in the future of Krakoa and mutants in general. And she has to stop him. So that's kind of like the big confrontation that's being brewed right now is Destiny versus Mr. Sinister. Look, this book is kind of making good on Kira Gillen's promise of political intrigue and you know the, the Quiet Council drama. And that's all it is right now. It's, it's you know, two members of the Quiet Council trying to outmaneuver each other. Destiny trying to run the, the future of mutant kind because she can see it. Sinister trying to run the future of mutant kind because he thinks he's smarter than everyone else. You know, she's running through all of these possible timelines. And you know what? Some of them were actually kind of cool, but you could see that like the dead ends of the timelines but she's trying to get into one in particular that's way down the line that they're, they refer to as the expanse that's where she realizes sinister cloned moira and gave and, and put his her dna into him giving him her mutant powers so when future space giant phoenix exodus eats him the, the timeline resets, and that's when she figures out Moira. Moira is the key. We did see Mr. Sinister. He has an entire laboratory full of Moiras, and he's doing lots of experiments. Anytime something doesn't work out in his favor, he uses his Moira, and basically he resets time, and she realizes that, and that is the big obstacle between her and the future that she needs. And that's kind of like the heartbreaking situation, I guess, in all that, in the big reveal at the end, is she seeing all these timelines, but there's one person that's essentially absent in all of them, and that is Mystique herself. The love of her life, the reason that she's doing all this, she might not be able to be there with her in the future. And, and she talks about all of the regret she has with how she had seen this death, like her death back in the in the in the eighties coming. Part of it required her to never tell Mystique, or else Mystique would prevent it. Yeah, she does see into the future where this time mystique isn't there and that's pretty much the entire comic book it's not bad you know it does provide the the political intrigue the drama of the quiet council itself like i said it's not really written to my taste i would prefer more action i certainly would prefer less uh poetry like uh, dialogue and introspective moments within the comic book but for what it is, it is executed at a pretty high level. The art is perfectly fine. So, you know, as you said, I, I would prefer a lot less flowery prose. Kieran Gillen isn't talented enough to write it. Yes, he made good on on what he promised, but it's just fucking boring. Sorry. I would agree on that. But if, if that's the kind of comic book you like, you're going to appreciate it more than me. I would recommend it to X-Men fans. But if you really like Kieran Gillen's writing and you really like dialogue and introspective that is very flowery in nature 
you're probably going to love this comic book. That's exactly what it is. It turns out that Mr. Sinister is a very big deal just throughout the X-Men line. He's also heavily featured in this week's X-Men number 12. Is it like the end of the line for this X-Men team? That's what it feels like. We got Jerry Duggan, Pepe the Raz on art, so it looks fantastic. This is better than a lot of what Jerry Duggan has been putting out because it does cap a lot of the stories. We finally get some finality on a lot of things. We get right into Dr. Stasis, who was revealed to be Mr. Sinister, but instead of a diamond, he's got a, a club on his head. And we get this conflict, and there's some arguments between Cyclops and obviously Mr. Sinister. And this Sinister thinks he's Nathaniel Essex, that the others are all posers, and he's the original. It's again, it's very anticlimactic. They talk, they blow up a roof, they get stuck. I- Sinister escapes. And then that's it. And he ends up on, I guess, the Orca station. That's pretty much it. Like, there's not really any major conclusion to that. The big reveal is I'm really Nathaniel Essex and all the other Sinisters are fakes. And But at the same time, why should we believe that at this point? I, I don't. And I don't really care. It's like, okay, whatever. Yeah. A guy that a guy that is known for having an almost obscene infinite number of clones with slight different variations on them has one with a slight different variation on them. I'm I'm not shocked. And in fact, I'm terribly disappointed that we didn't actually get a new villain. We just got a, a reskinned version of the same villain. That's my big issue with it as well. We also get the conclusion of Girls Night Out. On Game World, we've got uh, Jean Grey, we got Rogue, we got Laura X23. I think maybe um, Polaris is in there as well. And they're fighting Cordyceps Jones. He's meant yep. to be like this big threat, but he's not really. He's basically just bamboozled by Jean Grey almost immediately. Turns out she's such a good uh, telekinetic, she can just control the spores and everything and shut it down. They've explored Jean having that level of control. She can pick people up. She could pick up rocks, like big rocks, grabbing all these spores out of the air and like out of people's bodies, pulling them completely out. That's a level of fine motor control that literally no one has. And that's Jerry Duggan, again, being a poor writer because he wrote himself into a quarter and then tried to write himself out by wildly overpowering the characters. Yeah, because there's like millions of spores. There, there's there's trillions of spores there. <laughs> Not only can Gene pull them all entirely out of the air so that Polaris can, I guess, hold them in a giant bubble. Because spores are magnetic, Doc. You don't yes, get it. Yes, exactly. They're made of metal. All of the stakes where the team might actually have been in peril that they gave us at the end of last year, last issue, and the first couple of fights or you know pages of this fight yeah gene was lying to him and to the reader nope it's not actually real we were kicking his ass the whole time and he didn't know it and you didn't know it look how great we are and then we get the big moment where they say hey remember when we got this x-men team together gene you said until you've saved as many people as you killed when you were the phoenix that you would keep doing this and now that we've saved all these planets that people were betting on in Game World and these worlds that they were destroying, you've, you've saved trillions upon trillions of people, so you've finally done it. Yeah. And everyone gave her, like, a slow clap. And then they decide that uh, a lot of these adventures are over. You know, this team's about to get voted out because we got the Hellfire Gala coming up. So they had to give some reasons for people leaving the team. From the way I understand it, Polaris wants to get laid. And apparently... Being a member of the X-Men has impeded that opportunity, so she's moving on to Kiss Boys. Rogue has a higher calling. She needs to go work with her mother's Destiny and Mystique. So she's leaving the team so she can join up with them, I guess, fighting Mr. Sinister in the Quiet Council and doing all that. I didn't really understand or get why X-23 is leaving, but she's leaving as well, correct? Yep. They're, they're taking her off the team and all of that promise of, oh, we're going to explore the dynamic between Sync and X-23. Yeah, that never fucking happened. And now she's written out of the book before it happened. Oh, and by the way, did you know Sunfire was even on the fucking team? He's oh, quitting, too. I forgot too. about him. He's yeah, not he, there either. Nobody remembered that he was there in the first place because he didn't do anything for 12 issues. So we have three members left. We have Cyclops, who knows he's going to get in trouble. We'll get to that here in a second. We have Jean Grey, who obviously is going to be joining him. Even though she's saved a trillion people, she's not going to leave the team. And then we have Sink, the character who really shouldn't be there to begin with, is like, oh, yeah, I'm going to stick around. Let's see who gets voted into the gala. So I guess 
I don't know if it's satisfying, but there is a conclusion to what this X team is and what their exploits are. I don't think they did very much, but they did defeat Cordyceps Jones, so they did defeat one of the villains. And then the other big thing in this issue is, I guess, Cyclops and Sink felt bad because Sink used Jean Grey's powers to manipulate Ben Ulrich, take his story away from him about the X-Men being able to resurrect, and they went and gave him all the information back, and they apologized at a time. Yeah. The, the, there was no drama to this at all. That was at like the all. most intriguing part of the very first issue was Ben Ulrich. I was like, oh, this is really cool that they're including this character, discovering that they have uh, resurrection powers. I wonder what they're going to do with it. A lot of directions they could go with this. And then they basically just didn't do anything. They mind wiped him and then they gave him the story back. It was like, okay. Yeah. And then the story ended up being very underwhelming. Hey, the mutants can come back. We don't know how. We know that it's only only for mutants. Because that's something to do with their DNA. But hey, they can come back now. Everybody's like, yeah, we've seen them all die like a dozen times. So this isn't surprising. This is another case where I feel like Jerry Duggan wrote something interesting initially, then realized he didn't know what to do with it. So he wrote himself out of that quarter with, oh, my God, he was mind wiped. And then he's like, oh, wait, I probably should have done something with that because it was actually the only really unique thing. Once he got done with deciding that one of the villains that he created was just another villain, the other one he was going to dispatch in about five seconds. Like he just like forgot about Fei Long. Yeah, all, all the, 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 the relatively intriguing stuff that he did in the first issue, every single part of it flopped by the end here. And this is the conclusion, I guess, of this X-Men team's journey. It's over. They're moving on. We're getting the big vote coming up in Hellfire Gala. They definitely talked about the gala many times within this issue to let you know that it was coming up. If you've been reading X-Men, this is almost this is like a must read. You have to read this one because it does conclude three very major storylines. And it, it does uh, also bridge the gap, I guess, to the next chapter of this Mr. Sinister, Dr. Stasis thing with Orcus or whatever. Was it overly impressed? I will give it the most light ass recommendation i possibly can the art is good uh it does give you conclusions which is better than you get in a lot of x-men comic books these days but uh, this x-men run is very underwhelming the team essentially did nothing a lot of them never got highlighted is it time for another x-men team i guess because they say it is but it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like there was really a good reason to even do this because nothing really happened I wouldn't even really recommend it because, see, I can, for those of you that haven't read it yet, yes, there are three conclusions, but um, at the end, all three conclusions are, well, that's over and nothing changed. We are heading to the Hellfire Gala, and you can be sure that Doc and I will be covering that bad boy in full. I'm glad it's just one issue and not a big event this year. Not a big fan of this, but we do have some Hellfire Gala coverage for you here. I'm very cynical about this, but if you want some information, we got it. Get ready for Hellfire Gala because Doc and I will be on the case.